arrested for disorderly conduct outside the second presidential debate that year for asserting that I had been on the NFL and she should be included on the debate stage. Jill is no stranger to being arrested. In 2016, she again won the uh, Green Party nomination for president, along with 50 candidate John Baraka. In September of that year, she was protesting with the water protectors at Standing Rock and spray painted a piece of construction equipment. This too led her to be arrested for interfering. In 2024, she has once again won the Green Party nomination for president, along with UP candidate Butch Ware. This past April, after being invited to join a pro-Palestinian student protest at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, she was violently arrested and thrown in jail once again. Despite continued oppression, she has stood fearlessly in the face of danger time and time again, strong in her beliefs and moral convictions to elevate the voices of oppressed and working class people all across the country. She stands for things that we all support, that if everyone just gave it a little bit of consideration, they would support as well. Things like ending the occupation in Gaza, ending military aid to Israel. She calls for a $25 an hour minimum wage, Medicare for all, and rent control in the United States. Of course, we're agreeing, so she, of course, demands the ending of fossil fuel extraction and continued fracking, which is destroying our country. I hope you would all please join me in welcoming the next President of the United States. <laughs> Or scare us into being quiet. 
We are standing up and we are standing proud. When people say to me, aren't you afraid of being smeared? Aren't you afraid of being attacked? Well, I would say, as Shauna knows well, we have all been attacked and smeared for many years now. This is not new to us. The greatest danger, in my mind, is in not speaking out, in not opposing the genocide, the normalization of the torture and murder of children on an industrial scale. That is the real danger, that we allow our civilization essentially to be dismantled, that we allow international law and human rights to be taken down. That is what we really have to fear, not speaking out. We absolutely must continue to speak out and to urge and to urge everyone not to give their vote to genocide. Because if you vote for either of the genocide candidates, you are endorsing genocide, you are affirming it, and you are enabling it. There's no uh, ducking that, there's no closing your eyes to it. This cannot go forward without your permission. So deny the genocide was your permission. Do not sell your soul, do not compromise your humanity. We are standing tall together. To stand <laughs> and to abandon Harris, formerly abandoned Biden, for their leadership and their courage and their willingness to stand up and take the heat from the very start to call this in the way that it has to be called. This is a moral outrage. We must not go there. And the Muslim American community, who has more at risk than anyone here in this election, uh, no matter which way it goes, they are very much in the target areas here. But they've also been on the front lines of this crisis of empire. Uh, genocide and the slaughter of innocent civilians is not new. It's taking place in an unprecedented, horrific way, the first live stream genocide. But this, you know, fact of millions of people, innocent who have been murdered uh, just in the course of the post 9-11 wars, which were carried out for what? You know, this was to stop weapons of mass destruction. These are wars based on lies that simply make us less secure, not more secure, create failed states, mass refugee migrations, ongoing terrorist threats. Uh, these have been a disaster from the start. So what we must do is not only stand up to oppose genocide, we are standing up also to oppose ethnic cleansing, occupation, and empire in general. And it's Muslim Americans and Arab Americans who've been on the receiving end of this crisis for decades. So uh, my hat's off to the Muslim American and Arab American communities. For genocide is completely off the charts. You know, not only the slaughter of some 200,000 uh, innocent civilians and the systematic torture really of every resident of Gaza, even those who have not yet been murdered, thank goodness, and we are doing all we can to stop this murder, they are tortured on a daily basis starved, deprived of water, their housing is destroyed, they are living on the street, even their tents are bombed and set afire. Um, they, they have had their health care and their hospitals purposefully targeted their universities. Recently, um, data has come out showing that, in fact, the Israeli occupation forces are targeting children and shooting children actually in the head. This is now established as practice of the Israeli occupation forces. Uh, this is just unthinkable. They, of course, 
continue to target healthcare facilities and hospitals, most recently setting a fire to one of the hospitals in central Gaza where there was just unbelievably horrific footage showing uh, disabled people confined to their beds being burned alive by the actions of Israel. And unfortunately, this has become the rule, not the exception. This is just, um, you know, genocide on steroids. And now that genocide is focusing on northern Gaza, where there is a policy being implemented of basically leave or be murdered, leave or starve, leave or be considered a terrorist. And it's not stopping there. The, um, the genocidal uh, practices have now expanded into the West Bank and importantly into Lebanon. Israel has been preparing for war on Lebanon, has been egging uh, to expand this war for some time. Now it is here and the slaughter is taking place in Lebanon. This could be stopped with a simple phone call like Ronald Reagan did in 1982 when he called Menachem Begin and said, your war is over. The idea of having invaded Lebanon at that time as well, pursuing the PLO, which was the uh, Hamas of its day, the so-called terrorist organization, they had pursued them uh, into Lebanon and were slaughtering people by the thousands, a drop in the bucket actually compared to what's going on today. Yet that was enough for Ronald Reagan, not exactly your model peace president, that was enough for him to say it's over, he picked up the telephone and within 24 hours Israel had brought its troops back and the bombs and missile strikes had ended. That is what we need to do right now, and every vote for our campaign is a shot across the bow of the empire, telling them we want that end, that weapons embargo, and that end to genocide now. Which one can pledge greater 
allegiance to Israel. So the uh, Biden-Harris administration has uh, basically now sent very sophisticated missile defense into, uh, into Israel, anticipating that there will be a big strike back from Iran. And one of the more shocking pieces of news I saw just the other day was a statement from, I believe, the Biden administration saying, well, actually this was from Israel, saying that they don't intend to attack the nuclear facilities on the first strike, but they are expecting a response from Iran, and then they will basically unleash all their, you know, all their weapons striking full force against Iran, including their nuclear facilities. So this is just allowing all hell to break loose here. This is a complete nightmare that our warmongering uh, president and vice president are rushing into. This is like before World War I, in its complexity, because you bring in Russia, you may very well bring in China as well. And by the way, we have some 40,000 US servicemen and women who are already in the Middle East, who are very much sitting ducks, uh, should conflict, a wider conflict break out in the Middle East. Um, plus we have two aircraft carrier uh, groups of naval ships, so that means both an aircraft carrier and the destroyers, there are about five vessels that go with every aircraft carrier. 5,000 servicemen and women go with each aircraft carrier. We have one that's been positioned off the coast of Iran for a couple months, actually many months, and then a new one that just, uh, that just motored over there like within the last two to three weeks uh, off the, uh, uh, basically off the Mediterranean coast of Israel. So we have been preparing for a much bigger battle this could change everything. If we become involved in a major regional war, this is a disaster. Uh, this is begging for the use of nuclear weapons. Israel has already threatened to use nuclear weapons, even on Gaza itself. And if uh, Iran becomes involved and other countries join in, it, I mean, who would put this beyond Bibi Netanyahu to use a nuclear weapon? And if they do, well, we could very well see Russia responding in kind. Nuclear war is never over there. It's always global. Because when you see that mushroom cloud going up from a nuclear detonation, that represents a conveyor belt that is moving debris into the upper atmosphere. And what that is called is nuclear winter because the atmosphere gets dimmed, there's less sunlight coming in, and because it's above the weather, it doesn't rain or get you know blown down or snow down. It stays there for decades, so you can't come back from a nuclear exchange. A single nuclear armed submarine contains the equivalent of 5,000 Hiroshima bombs. 5,000, and it doesn't take very many of these, um, several dozen, that's about it. A, an exchange of even tactical nuclear weapons that's relatively small is enough to put us into nuclear winter. And how bad that nuclear winter, how many millions of people starve, depend on how many nukes are exchanged. But if you start bringing in the big powers, um, this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is a very uh, serious proposition. This is a major game changer. Yet we are being led blindly into this by leaders who miss leaders, criminal, war criminals, effectively, who do not recognize the dangers of nuclear war, who are extremely cavalier about it, who say things like, oh, don't worry about it because it's over there. You know, they are just ignorant of the risks that are being taken. This is why, this is why it is so critically important 
that we stand up now. We stand up now to say no to the war criminals and the war mongers who occupy the White House and who are contesting for the presidential election. Because we need to get the war mongers out of the business of running the country before they get us all killed. You know, it's not only the risks of war, it's also the cost of war. And this is where our, our welfare here at home uh, comes into play. Because the endless war machine and the endless wars of empire go hand in hand with the war on working people here at home. When we are spending half of our congressional budget on the endless war machine, we do not have the dollars that we need for FEMA, for example, to uh, assist the people who, whose homes and businesses and communities have been destroyed. FEMA is about $9 billion short of responding to the recent uh, double hurricanes. Well, $9 billion is exactly what was just shipped over to Israel, $9 billion in weapons to uh, allow Israel to expand its uh, very dangerous war. But it's not just FEMA, of course. This is, you know, the lack of health care and housing and education and the fact of student debt. Over 60% of Americans are now living paycheck to paycheck. Americans deserve a $25 minimum wage. We need to have that and have support for that now. Through regime change operations, through endless wars, 
1996, through the war on drugs, and on day one of our administration, we would legalize cannabis as a first step towards treating substance use as a public health issue, not as a criminal issue.
we will start the construction of affordable public housing, so-called social housing, which is not built for the profit of the developers, but is built in the public domain for we the people to have affordable housing that we need. which we badly need to upgrade and coordinate because right now it's a completely discoordinated, privately owned system. Yeah. That and our energy system, they need to be brought into public ownership, public management. <laughs> of Israel will not survive.
Um, today it was Hill Rising. I don't know how many people watch Hill Rising out there, but I, I, I watch it. It's a good source of news. But um, uh, today, you know, they were going all in on me. It, well, not all of them. Not Robbie Suave, <laughs> but the other. It was the Democrats. They had two Democratic Party shills that were basically saying the talking points of that ridiculous ad. And if you look at the comments, people are just irate. They're just outraged. They are so sick of being of being smeared and kind of led around by the nose. And what is so shocking to me is that this really isn't new. This is kind of what they've been doing. This is my third run. And they've done this all along. But it's like we are a different, we're in a different moment in history right now. And people are breaking up with this abusive relationship, this abusive political relationship. People are breaking up. And they're thrown under the bus on jobs, on health care, on education, on housing. They are sick of being thrown under the bus and they are really sick of being manipulated and, you know, to have this manufactured consent going on. You know, to read the media, it sounds like everybody is a happy camper and gladly voting for Kamala Harris, you know, you know except for the so-called crazies. But, you know, who's voting for Trump? It's not because people love Trump. There are some racists out there, yes, absolutely, who are voting for Trump. But a lot of Trump supporters are simply voting for him because they're so pissed off at the Democrats for betraying their promises over and over again. But it is not a world of happy campers out there. People are really pissed off, and they are this close to not voting at all or actually voting for us if they can hear about us. And that's why what Workers Strike Back and our campaign are doing, and what we're doing together is so incredibly powerful. And let me say that this, this working uh, alliance here really terrifies them, that, that um, workers and Chama's organization and Muslim Americans and the Green Party uh, and students uh, and African Americans, we are standing up and declaring our political, not only declaring our political independence, but that we are actually taking a stand for what it is that we want and we need. And right now, that is the Steinmeier campaign in this election. They are absolutely terrified. The Democrats, especially, are completely freaking out, which is why they keep running this uh, absolutely ridiculous, pathetic attack ad in one form or another. You know, it was AOC, it was Keith Ellison, uh, you know, it, well, it's Mehdi Hassan. It's the same story every time. It's these tired, worn out, uh, dead smears that they've been using actually uh, for a decade or two against me. And they don't get traction and people are really pissed off. It is a testimony to how scared they are. And let me just add that the fact that we could be heading into World War III right now, the fact that there is a real risk of a massive expanding regional war, it doesn't even have to become World War III, but a serious war with Iran now will be devastating to the region, to U.S. Uh, armed, you know, armed forces that are in the region. They are in the target here. Remember, we now have a draft. We have a draft which is operational, and it is collecting names. It knows where you are. You are being automatically registered if you are between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, and that draft, all it takes is for the president to say, okay, we're at war, we have an emergency, you're going over to defend Israel. That could actually be happening. Um, there is a real risk of that. So. I'm not convinced that we can't win this election. It really depends on what history does in the next couple of weeks. And I would not rule out a major calamitous event, whether it's a third hurricane that happens to hit a population center with no warning, in fact. Because that's another danger. It's not only that the hurricanes are more powerful, it's that they ramp up really fast now. The most powerful ever was one year ago that hit Mexico. We haven't heard about it here. 
But that hurricane was totally unpredicted. And in the course of 24 hours, it went from a storm that wasn't really raising alarms whatsoever to a Category 5 hurricane in 24 hours. So there was no time to evacuate or to put out warnings. That's the new world that we're in right now, this brave new world brought to us by the parties of war and Wall Street and fossil fuel extraction. That's where we are. And we could be there again. We are on the verge of catastrophe on so many dimensions right now, climate and especially um, uh, endless war and potential nuclear engagement. We are so close to the edge right now that we could tip into truly uh, catastrophic circumstances between now and the election. And when that happens, things can flip in a completely unexpected way. That's not to say that we should hold our breath that we're going to win the election. I just wouldn't rule it out. And the harder we work, the higher we will achieve. And, you know, one of the rules of Malcolm X is that you never let your enemy tell you how many of you there are. Likewise, we do not allow the predatory political parties to tell us what is a victory. A victory is for us to do the most that we can with the cards that we are dealt. So we're dealt some pretty amazing cards right now. And to look at what's happening on social media and on YouTube, there is a huge wake up that's going on right now. So I really urge people to sign up, to own this campaign, to own our future, to reject the propaganda of powerlessness, to embrace our power and to know in 2020, one out of every three eligible voters did not vote because they rejected the two zombie candidates being rammed down their throats. So if word gets out, there could be a whole lot of people who are coming out to vote in this race. And what we can do is exactly what Shauna and Workers Strike Back are doing, what our campaign is doing. We have training sessions, especially for those who are online who are not at centers of uh, Workers Strike Back all over the country. We are doing uh, online trainings and phone banking. We have data sets wherever you are for numbers you can call and scripts. I urge you, phone banking, flyering, we can get flyers to you uh, for you to go out and table. This is such a, um, a, a pivotal moment. We are at the breaking point right now as working people, as families, as uh, farmers, you know, you name it, as African Americans, uh, as immigrants, we are very much at the breaking, as students, uh, we are at the breaking point. And we can turn that breaking point into a tipping point. And history can do all sorts of wild things right now in this yep. era that we're in. Yeah. So we want to get out there, and if everyone is a foot soldier for this campaign, there's no end to what we can do. My hope is that we get to 5%. But that is a minimum. If we get to 5%, it's a whole new ball game going forward. That won't be easy to do, and Sean is exactly right. We have to fight for every vote that we're going to get. I wouldn't expect that we're going to win, but I wouldn't expect that we're not going to win either. It's a win as we define it. It's a win for fighting as hard as we can and for making use of this perfect storm. We are in a perfect storm for political realignment. It's been begging to happen for a long time. It kind of gets closer and further away. We've never been as close as we are right now. That is a tribute to every one of you, every one of us that are standing up and fighting for an America and world that works for all of us. Uh, as Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As Gaza goes, we all go. We must stand up for a world that we deserve, and together we are absolutely unstoppable. So thank you all so very much.